So, I want to talk about depth because um, we have been addressing composition, we have been addressing values. Do you still hear me well? Is it is it functioning perfectly? I think Zoom is working much better than Tim. Um, so we have talked about quite a bunch of stuff so far. Even if we are still at the beginning of the semester, we are well, we are reaching the first third of that semester already. And there is because because of part of the first assignment that uh, I'm giving you all, um, one of those assignments is a, a landscape. And because you will have to you will have to learn that uh, one of the essential aspects of landscapes in general is depth. Um, so when I when I talk about depth within your artwork, uh, I can mean two things. I can mean obviously the depth of the meaning in a way, but uh, we kind of talked about it in the conversation we have had about symbols and symbolic in the work. Uh, conversations that we have had with the illustration class as well. Um, there is a there is practical depth. There is. Um, uh, or do you make us feel when we look at your landscape that it is something that we can go through? If you paint a scene, uh, or do you, or do you paint it in a way that it does not look just like a flat surface, but but something that we can we can travel into? Uh, that is the depth in your artwork. When I talk about this, you probably just visualize some kind of sceneries where we have a foreground, a middle ground, and some, I don't know, mountains in the back with the shape of a castle, or just, you can start thinking about this. But depth is also affecting even uh, the pose of a character, for example. If you think about some kind of superhero pose with Spider-Man coming at you with his hands first, and then another hand in the back, you you are supposed to give depth to this. So in a way, I like that, that concept of concept of depth into your artwork is something that you can apply to landscape, but to characters, to scenes, to anything, uh, really. It's important because it comes with 3D. As soon as you start painting something in 3D, it means that something, some parts are closer to you than others. Um, one of the way uh, we are used to the imagication, that's not a word, but um, the made into an image presentation of depth is, for example, if you are using your camera and you decide to adjust the focus and your subject will be sharp where the background will get blurry and it will give us that feeling of what is in focus and what is not, what is behind, what is in front. Um, this is depth as well. Depth of field is something we use. You see it in, you see it in movies, you see it in photos, you see it in video games as well. Uh, one of the things that was one of the focus of video game makers for a long time was to build that feeling of... Again, I'm, I'm repeating that word, but that's what today is about, that feeling of depth. So you are playing this character, right? And you escape from a, you escape from a cave, for example. And the entire landscape opens in front of you. I'm thinking like from The Last of Us that is very popular right now to Horizon Down or any kind of games that are containing some kind of exploration. It's very important to give that feeling of that massive feeling of environment and to let the player 
think, wow, can I go there? If you play games like um, The Elden Ring, it's a good example of this. Uh, because in, in The Elden Ring, you don't have a... I don't think there is anything that you can see in the distance that you cannot reach somehow. And that's a good feeling in video games. To know that you are playing a game where if you see somewhere very, very far away, you know you can get there and it becomes part of the game. It's not just part of a background to make it look pretty. It's here because you can get there. It's here to attract your eyes somewhere far in the distance. So it invites you to cross that distance and to travel and to engage, literally engage into the game. Um, and that's the same within an image. Um, I have seen many times students painting background scenes into their illustration just because they felt like they had to paint a background. And they don't realize that this idea of painting that background is part of the story itself. We talked about that, the elements that you choose to include in your work or not. Um, if you put a castle in the back, you are telling us many things. You are telling us, first of all, that's a medieval environment. Uh, but it is, no matter what, it's an element that you choose to put in your artwork for a reason or another. But because, and when we are talking about composition, we were talking about the amount of focus and, and the priority you want to give to the elements that you put in your image. If that castle is blurry, not contrasted at all, disappearing in the back, you are telling us that it's not a priority into the image. Anyway, I'm talking kind of uh, in random ways right now, just giving you some kind of idea of what we are about to, to discuss. I'm just trying to build the, the picture in your head uh, a bit. Depth is a narrative element. You can use that to talk about the things that the characters in the image have to accomplish. You can use it as a distance, um, separating the characters to their goal, uh, or the viewer to, you know, invite the viewer into the scene by giving them a landscape that makes them want to travel through. So again, depth is really important. But I'm going to like stop just talking about it, and I'm going to start showing you some stuff a bit. Um, I need a landscape. And I have some, but I don't want to read the same all over. Oh yeah, it is. This one is good. I'm about to share my screen, just be patient, it's coming. So we just transitioned from team to Zoom and I have to remember how to share everything, how to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, share screen. Almost, sorry. And I'm putting all my students upstairs. So I can see you up and share my 
screen with a stream chat. Okay, so this image is actually a good one to talk about what I'm talking about. Um, I am using something that is called sfumato in Italian, if I'm not mistaken, because sometimes I am. But it is the idea that um, the more you look into the distance, the more you lose contrast. Okay, so the formula is really simple and I want you to, to see how obviously simple it is. We have some areas closer to us that are contrasted with some dark, some sharp shapes. You know, those three right there, all that. And the more we go in the distance, the more we lose some of this contrast up to a place somewhere in the background where that contrast is gone. We know, so basically to make it really obvious, we know that the texture in real life, we know that if we travel here and then we travel here, we know that the texture on the mountain is going to be the same. There will be the same trees, there will be the same rocks. We know that there is the same amount of contrast and texture. But when you paint it, you have to think about the way we look at things, uh, what our human eye is capable of perceiving in the distance and, and how much uh, atmosphere particles. That's probably not the scientific way to talk about it, but um, how much particles and, you know, air atmosphere separate us from, from, from that mountain. So basically, there is not nothing between our eyes and this mountain. There is in fact a lot of things and there is a lot of air particles that I think may be a little bluish, which means that this is why usually when you paint things in the distance, you tend to add a little bit of blue in your color palette just to give us that feeling of distance. Uh, I'm not going to ask you all to just go to the window and look in the distance, but I'm going to ask you to think about it. Because if you start to think about, if you were to look by the window right now and look in the distance, you will see that if there are hills, for example, the hills closer to you, you can see more details and more contrast, but the hills behind that are fading away and the hills even behind that are fading away even more. And if you were to paint it, you will add maybe a bit of that foggy blue, just barely, but just to make that landscape disappear into blue air particles. And again, if any one of you have like some scientific education on the matter, I probably sound ridiculous. But uh, my goal is just to make you paint better. So, um, so I'm applying this in this image, you know, by making sure that I simplify my shapes. So I do several things. I simplify the shapes. I contrast less. I, to contrast less, for example, that means less details, less color variations, less values, uh, less values, uh, conflict and contrast. So for example, here on the foreground, we still do have a contrast of values right there between basically what is lighter and what is darker and lighter on the rock and darker right here. You see that? And so that contrast that's happening right here is completely gone on the mountains in the background. And even if you start looking, if you look at the middle right there, the contrast is not as important as the contrast happening here. So you get that one of the first rules if you are trying to paint depth is to reduce contrast. Sometimes some um, students ask me, they are like, oh, so basically what we have to do is make the foreground darker. Okay, we could even have a character standing right here. Hey, I'm standing right here, you know. And we could have that, that character standing right here. We make, we make it darker and then it gets more mid-ground mid-range, and then in the distance it gets lighter. That's not exactly what it is, 
it is what it is right now for that specific image in that specific context. But you could totally be painting an image where the foreground is brighter. Think about a scene at night and you have a torch. Okay, you are playing Alan Wake or Alone in the Dark and you have a torch. Everything that is closer to you will get brighter and everything will fade in darkness in the distance. So we have the opposite system than what we have on the screen right now. So really what the rule is, is more about contrast. What is closer to you has more contrast and the deeper you get, the more you lose that contrast. It's not darker or lighter, it's more or less contrast. Okay, does that make sense? So, what's at play here is that even as I'm going the distance, there is even the sky, the brightness of the sky and the mountain, they don't contrast as much. And earlier, a student asked me uh, about brush, brush strokes and um, basically the hardness of brush strokes. And I told that student that this was something I would answer in class. So the topic of the quality of the brush strokes and the edges and the hardness or harshness, harshness of um, brush strokes is, is a very, very important topic. And it will be addressed for what it is. But there is a use of this when you talk about depth. And that's something that I want you to look at right now. Obviously, in this image, there is a lot of painting and there is also a lot of photo bashing and, and, and photo texturing. Um, if I'm sharing with you, you should be able to see that. Wait a second, let me, let me find it. It has to be somewhere. Yeah, so if I... If I take this, I guess, oops, you should be able to, that's not, uh, you should be able to see the animating, I mean, animated GIF of the painting process. So you see there is a lot of photograph in this, a lot of, yeah, painting, photo manipulation at the same time. And the reason why, uh, The reason why I'm talking about this right now is because some of the photographic aspect of photographic element of this image are prevalent in the foreground when you see the shape of those trees right there. Let me use some red. Shape of those trees. Um, this is basically harder edges. Same thing here. Same thing here. This is painted sharp. This is painted with sharp brushes. All right. But if you look here, here, or here even, this is not sharp at all. Those are soft edge brushes that I'm using. Because depending of the amount of contrast I'm using in the artwork, I will change um, the type of brushes I use to have something Archer, crispier. My students make fun of me when I talk about crispiness. Um, crisper uh, than in the background where I want again less contrast. So therefore, I want less contrast of details, less contrast of well, that's it, less contrast of details. And so therefore, my brushes should be less detailed and be a bit more uh, almost smudgy. You know, does that make sense? So. There is a place where I kind of cheat with what I'm telling you in this image. If we have like all the foreground in red, that is level one. Level one of sharpness. And then in blue, I'm going to create a level two of sharpness. Same thing, if that makes sense for all of you. 
and somewhere in ye fading yellowish we will have a level 3 of sharpness and you can see it you know you can see when you look at that you can see that level 1 is way sharper than level 2 but the topic the real main important element of this image is that tower right there Okay, and that tower in itself is kind of painted with a level one of sharpness because, as I say, I'm cheating and I want the eyes of the viewer to focus on it a bit. So I'm kind of playing with it until I, until it feels right, you know. Um, but I think that's something interesting for you all to to consider is that no matter what you are doing, it's it's important to be able to play with that. So here is the rule: the f more far away it is the more it fades away. It's pretty simple. It's easy to apply, it's easy to understand. But sometimes you can like give it a twist and be, okay, all right, but I still want the viewer to really not miss this. And so therefore, because it's a focus point, we talked about that in the composition class, Therefore, I increase the contrast, I increase the details, I increase the colors, I increase everything. That's why I even put quite often some birds in the sky. No, we have a... <laughs> uh, some birds in the sky because those birds are going to attract the eye because they are like tiny details. Also, those birds suggest life in an image that is kind of completely dead. Um, do you have questions so far? Whether you are my student in class or someone in the following the stream. Um, by the way, for the ones of you listening to the stream, is the quality all right? Does it work? Can you hear me well and all this? So. Another way I talk about depth in this image, not talk about depth, but show depth, is that I have a, I'm using, I'm using little tricks in a way, simple little tricks that are helping a lot. One of them is that path that we can follow right there, and that leads us to the focus point. If you look at that. Yes, thank you for, thanks in the chat for confirming that I'm not talking to the void. Um, that path right there gives us that feeling of distance. Okay, it involves perspective, but it means that this character will, you know, and here is way smaller and here way smaller. And so to create that depth, I have to, I'm creating an element that the human eye identifies as a stable element, a path that we assume will have the same, you know, if we look at that path from the sky, it's a pretty regular path with, you know, kind of, it's just a normal path. But if I put it in perspective, if I manage to put it in perspective, if I put it in perspective, obviously the part that is closer to us feels bigger, right? And in the distance, so right now this is us on that path, but us later, and us later, and later, until we are like tiny dots back there in the castle, right? So. The perspective of this path is giving us a feeling of depth as well. It makes us feel that it will take a long walk to get from A to B back there. In fact, if I wanted to make it even more efficient in my demonstration, I will say from, that's a visual thing that I'm doing, from A right now to B back there. So that is exactly what is happening here with this path that is larger here and gets 
tiny, tiny back there where we can barely see it. And so we travel with an element that has a constant, but visually that constant is shrinking in the distance. So I'm using all those stuff when I work to give that feeling of depth. One way I like to think about it is to think about an image a kind of like a theater play where we will have, oh my god, this is not going to go well, but I'm doing it anyway. We will have background surfaces, right, panels in the back, standing in the back, and in front of it we could have a panel with a tree that is closer, see like the base is right here, and here we could have a character standing. Think about like all flat pieces of wood, right, that are just put together. And here in the foreground we could have a structure as well that you know is closer to the closer to the viewer. But in between all these there is a certain amount of space certain amount of air particles and atmosphere and, and things like that. So if you think about the image that you have right in front of you right now, we have we have panels as well, you know, we have like those foreground panels. And then later we have some other panels. And they are all put together with again a distance in between each. And if you really want to make your image intense, uh, if you really want to make, uh, to create that gigantic space into an image, you must increase that space. You must increase that distance and you must multiply the elements that make us understand how far away things are. Does that make sense? One day, when I ask, does that make sense? One of you will say, no, not at all. And we will have to, like, you know, address things. I'm going to do something else with that image. One last thing to just, uh, and then we'll look at other examples. But I'm going to paint full black some elements of this image, all of them, in fact. So here is one. On a new layer, I'm painting that one full black as well. On a new layer, I'm painting this element as well. On another layer, I'm going to paint this. On Another layer, I'm going to paint this. Some of you are like, oh, I know, I know what he's doing. On another layer, this one. On another layer, I'm going to go for this one and shortly enough we will have like the best painting I have ever painted I guess. On another layer I'm going to paint this one. Then I'm going to simplify this one and then the background. Here you go. You're all welcome. I'm glad you showed up today. This is a perfect demonstration. But okay, so joke aside now. What's going to happen is that if in between all of those layers, and those layers are kind of similar to the panel demonstration, like the theater stage I just talked about, if I'm starting to paint a soft fog in the image, things will appear, shapes will appear. So I'm going to, in between every one of those elements, I'm going to add a bit of fog. 
and I'm simply putting a layer between other layers, between every one of those elements. Do you start to see that depth that I was talking about? Just because I'm creating some atmosphere between, ooh, what's going on? Uh, it's just about layers, orders right there, but here you go. You start to see what I'm talking about? How much the atmosphere is creating distance between the different, different layers in your image. So, going back to the original, you see that system that is at play. You see it, you see the fog in between. I just painted the fog, I just used brushes and, and things that just make it look like fog. But it does not have to be fog. On this one, right now, it just feels like distance. It doesn't look like it is, it's especially foggy, it's more like the distance is creating that. So, if I share, I'm going to share other different images with you all, just to keep talking about that. Here is one. Here is a retro city, which is like the the place where one of, I mean, my main role playing game is happening, and you will see, you you can tell that the same exact same dynamic is at play right there. Do you see that? Again, that's a lot of fog. You don't have to over fog. I, retro city is foggy, but... And you see that on the ground, you have some details, you have some sharpness. And the more we go in the distance, the more we are losing this. We can still see shapes and lights, and, and that is an image that is done very brutally, in a way. Okay, there is some painting elements, but there is a lot of just lights from stuff put together and you can even see like some weird light texture in the sky that has no reason to be there but i kept it this way because in fact it makes us feel that there are massive buildings in the back that are shining shining from far away in the fog and i did like that a lot so uh, this is one example I'm going to keep sharing some more. This one is interesting. It's a bit. Uh, it's actually a bit different. This is an image created for another role-playing game of mine uh, called God. And you see, this image is not foggy, but there is less contrast between between these characters and this area. The characters are painted with a lot of contrast and the area behind them has less contrast. Then I'm cheating again because somewhere further in the distance I'm adding more contrast. And I'm doing this because this is where the characters want to go. And there are several several paths to go there. There is obviously that staircase going up. There is that weird bridge, but the bridge is broken, so that's not happening. So they are going to go from here to somewhere, taking that path right there, to go up to this place where they want to go. And depth is all about that. Another thing I use for depth, and it's something I really want you to pay attention to, it's the fact that um, I will use elements that your human eye can identify. Your human eye can identify the shape of it. So, if I put on the staircase, and again, pay attention to this, if I put on the staircase someone tall like this, I'm fucking things up. Because I'm killing the scale. That character is almost the same size as the character in the foreground. I just kill the depth. So all this character is a giant. And if it's a giant, once again, pay attention to that. If it's a giant, it means I should paint that giant with some values that are the values that we kind of find in the background of this image to make sure that it looks like it's not a mistake 
and that this character is indeed standing in the back like a guardian, like a giant guardian. But what I will do to increase the feeling of depth is that I will take elements like those birds because we know the size of a bird and we know that if the bird looks like that, that little dot, like those like tiny adorable pixels, you know, the legs, the beak, we can see some feathers right there, right? Uh, okay, so because that bird is so small in the background and because our human eye is able to mentally measure and do that kind of scale mathematic, if that bird is that small, it means the tower is that big. Does that make sense? How much of this perception of distance is affected by composition? You should, and I'm not sure that will answer your question, but I think you should compose um, with the creation of depth in mind. So a lot of it is affected by composition, a lot of it. But again, composition and perception of death, depth oops, uh, can conflict sometimes. And that's what I was explaining earlier with the example of that, that tower where, oh, where the tower is right here, where if I was just following the logic of depth, I will put less details in the tower, but because it's a predominant element in the storytelling and therefore in my composition, I still decide to break the rule of depth to give more, more details to it and to give, to give it more importance, narrative importance, more presence into the image. So building a perfectly um, valid feel of depth into, into your image also allows you to break it to serve your narrative purpose in a way. Now I'm going to share some things that are more character related, like this one, for example, where the background slowly disappears away and I'm using the shapes of the background to just kind of highlight the character itself from the circle of that gigantic sun. Um, to the direction of the ruins in the back that are just increasing the character's presence. It just completes the shape of the character standing in the middle. But as there is a lot of crisp details on the character, the background is just fading away. You basically simulate peripheral view by detailing the focal point. Yeah, yeah. Use your use your eye um, as a camera. Think about how much if I'm looking if I'm looking straight, but I have my hand on the side. Like there is no sharpness, there is not much details. It's part of it, yes. It's definitely part of it. But I'm going to keep sharing examples that can be interesting. I had this one. I I was randomly on my art station picking some examples of images that could illustrate what I'm talking about. And so you can you can see it on that, for example. You can see, same thing, the characters that are close to us, and you can see the depths of the forest in the back. Because I'm doing exactly what I was talking about. Um, I do the same with flowers, for example. You know, it, it's depth is also in details. So you see those purple flowers that we have in the, in the foreground right there? Um, if I have them here, and if I detail those purple flowers, like they are a bit right there, each flower will be made of like all those little petals, for example. And if I'm painting them in the distance, I will just probably make a dot right there, another one right there, and to a point where they become in the back just some spots, maybe it's just some, you know, nothing even really painted, just the color 
reminding us of the purple that comes from the flowers in the foreground. And just by doing that, just by creating a contrasting color code that is in the foreground, then I have to, I can just apply that color in the back without caring at all about how detailed it is, and that will do the job. If I'm not trying to paint with an eraser, it will do the job. See, back there, I can just do this kind of stuff, then go back and and erase, and they will just be they will just be there, you know, not as present, not as contrasted, just and that creates depth as well. I really like how texture your digital work looks compared to a lot of the uh, digital, I guess, fantasy stuff I see these days. Yeah, so it's because I, one of my favorite fantasy writer writes with a very, very modern wording. I'm thinking about uh, Glenn Cook who wrote the Black Company. And I love the fact that he has like very modern, almost noir writing uh, to a fantasy context. And I like, I like to paint fantasy the way I paint sci-fi. Uh, I like having that sharpness. This is also why I use a lot of photo texture and, and 3D and all this kind of stuff. It's to keep that realism because to me, fantasy is... Um, I like to explore a lot of things in fantasy that deserves realism and sharpness more than just uh, fogginess of a forest full of elves. I don't know how to talk about that. Too well. I mean, I do, but this is not really the, the topic of the day. But it's it's interesting nonetheless. Um, what else do I have to share with you? I can go on, you know. Like depth is implied in this one is a bit of a violent image in a way. Uh, that's a, that's what some people will refer to as a bad guy in Retro City. Um, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm taking an element in the foreground that we identify. I'm talking about the bird, specifically. So I'm taking that bird, and then I'm putting it back there, and back there, and then it gets like smaller in the background, tiny. And that tells us there is a lot of distance between bird number one and bird number whatever in the back back there. A lot of distance. To this, you add all the fog atmosphere in between. And even the fog, I even contrast, contrasted the fog because the fog in the distance is not as contrasted as the fog coming out of the gun or out of the character. I also... I also talk symbolically about the character when I make sure that there is the same kind of smoke coming from the firearm and coming from the face of the guy. They are the same person, you know, you know the smoke the same way, they are the same thing, because this person is a killer. Uh, there are visual hints that tell you, in that game you play, you play police detective and, and this character is definitely uh, an enemy in the game. But Anyway, um, there is even a little bit of depth on a smaller scale that separates the foreground right here and the character. And that little bit of depth is also by still using like a bit of atmospheric. So even, even on short distance, because we know that the distance between the foreground and the character is really short. But even in this, you can still see it. Does that make sense? And again, I keep asking that question, but that's really what I want. Like, I want my classes to make sense for you. That's why. I'm Perspective is obviously, uh, and I was trying to avoid going back to this image because we talked about this one in class not so long ago. But but let's do it. Um, where is it?
perspective is a huge factor into painting depth because as I was showing you this with that, um, that pass earlier, we know that if we look at the bridge from the sky, we know it's a parallel line bridge. But if we put it in perspective, I'm purposely making it not following the bridge perfectly so you can just see how you could play with that. Okay, but we know that as soon as we put something in perspective, we create depth. And I'm sure you see that. I don't know what Photoshop is trying to make me do, but here you go. So that, oh my god. All right, Photoshop, you are drunk. All right. We have a situation. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, perspective is essential for depth as well. I'm not going to, you know, if I was going to teach perspective, that's, uh, you learned that during the foundation classes. Um, and I'm just asking you to, to play with it, to apply it, uh, to have fun with it, to create depth. What else? What could we, what could we discuss that is connected to how do you make the viewer feel depth into the artwork? We have perspective. We have atmosphere, we have elements that we can use foreground and far away in the background that are just an indication of the scale of things. Um, colors, colors tend to fade, so it's also important to mention this. Colors tend to fade in the background and not be as intense as they are in the foreground. So you have an example of this with those intense colors in the foreground or even on the city because again the city is the center of attention so I kept that color boost but if you look in the back it's not that intense there is like one tip of the hill back there of the, the cliff that is still telling us a bit of light system but the colors are less intense here than they are here so Desaturation. I'm looking in the stream to see if there are some uh, some ideas and some examples going on. Uh, do you do I do artwork on paper? Yeah, I, originally I'm a traditional artist. I do a lot of drawing. I draw a lot uh, on my Instagram. You can. Uh, you can find some of it if you scroll down a bit. Here is my Instagram. Uh, so, same thing. Do the idea about depth and detail apply any differently to drawing a figure or a character design? Uh, that's something that I touched to at the beginning of that stream. It's that um, if you think about Spider-Man, who has like one hand closer to you, like any super action, superhero action pose with one hand closer to you and another one in the back, you will put more contrast into what's close to you and less contrast with what is far away. So whatever you apply on a big scale landscape, you can definitely apply it on a smaller scale character. Um, you can even refer to this idea that you can always go smaller, 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 like we are all, you know, for some creature, I'm a giant, and so, you know, the feeling of depth and, and gigantism is completely a matter of perception. Can color contrast replace value contrast? I mean, color on a similar value range, but different 
tonality. Well, I, I don't know. I, I always I think it's essential, and I'm saying that to my students because we are going to talk about colors uh, very soon. And do not confuse colors and values. And in the distance, the values fade away and mix together, and the colors fade away and mix together as well. So they are not the same thing at all. You must think about them completely on separate. Um, they are two very separate things, but they are affected the same way by distance. They fade, contrast fade, color fade, value fade. Have you touched depths in relation to portraits and people? Uh, stuff like someone doing, yeah, but that's exactly that's that's exactly what I was you know talking about when I talk about action, or even in a scene, you know, like if we have. If we are building I'm going to be really basic with shapes. We have the horizon line, we have a train track, and my perspective is going to be completely inaccurate. I'm just there is a we are not we are not talking about perspective today. Um, but we have that character that is here, working on that railroad, and if we paint the same character later, walking back there in the distance, I wield I will, no matter, it doesn't matter how you do that, whether you reduce the opacity or whether you paint it more gray or however you want to do that, I will reduce the contrast of this character, the value, the details. Because I'm going to show you that also in a minute. See what I'm doing back there? And one of the things that is problematic in what I'm doing is that I should fade my horizon line also, you know. Uh, the horizon line is a bit too brutal right now to really make a, a point on what I'm doing. So here we go. Same shape, same character. But in the distance, I'm fading that character away. So, on a okay, I don't know if that's going to work. So let me just think about that. So we have that character. And we have we have that character. So what I'm doing right now is because they are painted with exactly the same value and everything, we could think that we have someone who is just standing and the other one who is jumping, for example. But if that character, then I fade that character away, then we just have a character that is just a bit, because of the fading, we have a character that is now just a bit further down the path, if it makes sense. It work with, works with trees, it works with anything really, like you just fade things away. Think about that, you know, uh, um, I can think of a hundred songs called Fade Away, Fading Away. If you play cyberpunk, there is a samurai as that song say, saying uh, it's all about fading away as well. We never fade away. Um, that's, that's depth. Things fade away in the distance, you know, even think about all those movies that end with the character living in the distance or, you know, whatever. You can really start to make some. Uh, yeah, exactly. Never fade away the, the, the cyberpunk song 
or how to how to not create depth in your artwork. Just never fade away, and, and you will have no depth. Um, what's very dangerous in a character with in a character in a in a painting with no depth is that you end up putting things on the same level, and that flattens everything, and that basically makes you it makes you obtain the opposite of what you are trying to achieve. It makes your entire picture being just a wall of elements instead of placing them in the distance. And I really think that now that I talked about this a bit, I really think that the comparison that I did earlier with a theater stage where things are attached to the floor right there and you just have, you know, panels connected to the floor all of them at a different place, so we can have that tree in the background. And you know, think about it like they roll from the side to just install the stage and being removed and everything. And here we have, in front, we have that little kid with a sword. Same thing, it's just a, a panel and here on the foreground, we can have you know, another panel with uh, some branches and stuff going on. But everything is just something that is being sliding on stage at different levels of depth onto, onto that stage. And so it would be good, I think it would be a good idea for me to build something 3D like that, uh, to, to show it in class so you can see really how, how things work together. Um, but you should think about that. If we look at that image from the top, we will have a foreground with a sign saying exit, like it does with a raven sitting on it. And a bit later on that stage, we will have that panel with that main character. And then we will have a lot of space with far away in the distance, another panel with that massive building. You know? So again, I'm going to repeat that um, before I let you go. The elements that you can use, the tools you can use to create. Uh, just wait. The tools, the things that you manipulate to create that feeling of depth are perspective, elements that you can compare in scale a bird in the foreground, a bird far away in the background, trees close to you, trees far away in the distance, a path that is slowly shrinking in the distance. So again, scale. And contrast again. Not contrast in the way I talked about it in composition, but all those contrasts that I actually mentioned in composition, you can just diminish them. Fading the colors, fading the details, fading the values. And that will give depth into your artwork. And then there are narrative elements as well. You can have the pose of the characters looking in the distance, for example. You can have anything that just kind of creates that feeling of depth. And I did show you some landscapes based on my artwork, but think about it if I was someone who was a designer for, uh, I'm thinking about Pacific Rim, for example, or Transformers, like stuff where you see like massive um, hangar, garage, like m massive spaces with big robots and a lot of them in the distance with people working on them and everything. What I will do with this to create depth is that what will be, for example, I will have the first, uh, the first mech bot in the foreground and one other in the distance and it will be smaller and fading away. But you will identify the fact that they are the same shape that I just repeat further in the background, in the distance, and just by using the same shape, repeating it, but making it smaller and smaller, you create a lot of depth, to a point where at the end we can't see any details and we just have the feeling that we could walk into that factory forever, you know. I hope that works, I'm trying to create that, uh, I'm trying to create that mental image, I do that a lot in class, um, you are all going to start to get used to it when I'm 
sometimes I'm showing you visuals and sometimes I purposely don't because one of the things I'm really trying to create and generate in you, my students, is that ability to uh, create the mental image of what I'm talking about. Instead of giving you just an example like I did, you know, I'm showing you like some, some images that you can look at and, and really see practically what I'm talking about. But I also use words without images so you can start to build visuals in your head that uh, you may have to paint. Basically, I want your brain to be active. I want to, your brain to generate image based on the concept I'm talking about. Because I think you do learn more when I do this than if I just share a photo and, and, and show you, okay, this is what this is done this way and all that. Any questions? All right, so I'm going to disconnect the, the stream and say bye to everyone in the stream. I'm going to stay with my students for, for a few minutes. Uh, thank you all for showing up. I hope this was helpful. See you next week. This is becoming a habit and I'm glad it is. <laughs>